Hello, and welcome back to my channel. I'm so glad that you could join me today. We are finally, finally going to be continuing my series on America's Gilded Age families and what became of them. And we're going to be talking about the J.P. Morgan family. Now, I have been planning to make this video for months. I believe I said in August, July or August, that I was going to be making this video next, and then I got sidetracked, and then classes started and a whole lot of stuff happened, but finally we are back in the Gilded Age family, powerhouse family, whatever you want to call it, family saddle, and we're talking about J.P. Morgan. This was an interesting one to research. There's a lot of information about the earlier J.P. Morgan family, like about J.P. Morgan and about his father and even his grandfather, and about his son. But once you get to sort of the 1930s to the 1950s, there's really very little information. So with a lot of the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I'll just be kind of telling you their names and when they were born. <laughs> Sometimes I've been able to figure out what their children are named. And it's also difficult to find uh, estimations of net worths for members of the J.P. Morgan family. So this one is a lot more speculative than some of my other ones. But Let's get into it. We're gonna start off our tale in 1636 when Miles Morgan emigrated from Bristol in England to Boston in what was then called Plymouth Colony and is today called Massachusetts. And then we are going to skip until around 1800. There is information about what the Morgan family was doing between 1636 and 1800, but quite frankly, it is boring. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat it all. So we're gonna skip ahead to around 1800. Joseph Morgan III lived from 1780 to 1847. His father was a veteran of the Revolutionary War. Now, Joseph Morgan III had several business ventures, but we're gonna start in 1819 when he helped to co-found the Aetna Fire Insurance Company. This company is still around. It now deals in, in health insurance, I believe, not fire insurance, but it was founded back in 1819, partially by Joseph Morgan III. In 1835, New York City was decimated by the Great Fire of New York. This was bad news for most people, but it was good news for Joseph Morgan because he was able to use this to his advantage. The Aetna Company insured many of the businesses on Wall Street, and several of the Aetna investors were not very keen on paying out these massive policies because it was it was going to be a, a put a financial strain on the company to pay out all of these massive policies at once. So what Joseph Morgan did was to personally buy the shares of the company that were owned by these investors who were hesitant to pay out all of these insurance settlements. This gave him a very large stock in the company. The company also used this as a magnificent advertising opportunity. They really publicized the fire. It's called the Great Fire of New York because of the Aetna Fire Insurance Company publicizing it. And they publicized statements that all of the people who were insured by them were going to get their insurance payouts, even if all of the founders and the board of directors had to start paying out of their own pocket. And this heroic tone that they took of, oh, I will, I will pay you even if it means that I'm destitute, along with the fact that these payments were prompt and forthcoming, really cemented the Aetna Fire Insurance Company's reputation on Wall Street for the next or however long they kept on dealing in fire insurance. I don't know when they switched over to health insurance, but it really cemented the Aetna Fire Insurance Company's reputation on Wall Street, and they were able to raise their rates by about three times what they had been a couple of years down the line. And because Joseph Morgan had bought so many of the shares of this company, he owned a significant portion of it. So he saw a major amount of profit from this, and this is really where the Morgan family fortune began. Joseph Morgan's son was named Junius, I believe, J-U-N-I-U-S, Junius, Junius Spencer Morgan. He lived from 1813 until 1890, and he really broadened the reach of the family business. So he got involved in various business ventures, including the wholesale of dry goods, the import-export business, and most importantly, banking. In 1854, he became a junior partner at Peabody & Company, which was a, a banking house based out of London. In 1864, George Peabody, who was the head of the company, retired, and he handed the company over to J.S. Morgan, who changed the company name to J.S. Morgan & Company. J.S. Morgan remained active in the world of banking until 1877, when he entered a sort of semi-retirement. He withdrew further from public life in 1880 due to his failing health. In 1884, his wife, Juliet Pierpont, died, and that caused him to withdraw even further. 
He died in 1890 in Monte Carlo when he was thrown out of his carriage and he hit a wall. <sighs> Grizzly way to go. He left behind a fortune of, and I'm going to read this number because I don't trust myself to remember it exactly, uh, $12,400,000 uh, in 1890 money, which is the equivalent of about three, that's a lot of zeros, about $370 million today. So a pretty penny. Now, his son was John Pierpont Morgan. This is J.P. Morgan. This is the, the guy you think of when you think of the Morgan banking family, is J.P. Morgan, John Pierpont Morgan. He lived from 1837 to 1913. J.P. Morgan took over the company in 1890 after his father died. During his time on Wall Street, he spearheaded such companies as U.S. Steel, International Harvester, and General Electric. He also held controlling interests in Aetna Insurance Company, in Western Union, in the Pullman Car Company, and 21, count them, 21 railway companies. So he was rolling in it. Although J.P. Morgan was a very good businessman, he did have some business failures under his belt as well. One of these failures involved one Nikola Tesla. I'm sure you've heard of him. Tesla convinced Morgan to invest $150,000, which is the equivalent of uh, $4,885,800 today, into building a transatlantic wireless communication system. This project led to the construction of Wardenclyffe Tower in New York. Sadly, the project was never completed and it was, in fact, abandoned in 1906. But I'm sure you've probably heard of Wardenclyffe Tower, and it's interesting that, that J.P. Morgan funded it. It's difficult to overstate just how influential J.P. Morgan was to the world of American and international banking and industry and business. I have some facts and figures that I'm going to read off to you here, just so you can get an idea of how influential this man was. Between 1890 and 1913, 42 major corporations were organized or had their securities underwritten in whole or in part by J.P. Morgan and Company. Some of these companies are still around today, such as American Telephone and Telegraph, or AT&T, uh, General Election, and United States Steel. He also was involved in the Boomer Coke and Coal Company, and I just mentioned that because there is a very famous law case about the Boomer Company, and I have read it at least once every semester, sometimes twice every semester since starting law school, so it was very exciting to see that company popping up here. He was so influential that in 1907, when there was a huge financial panic, he was able to organize a coalition of different bankers and leaders of industry and basically saved the American economy. It would have just completely tanked if it had not been for J.P. Morgan stepping in and doing some sort of rich person economical magic. I don't know what he did. But he was able to save the American economy, which is incredibly impressive and also frightening that, that one man had the power to do that. I mean, he didn't do it single-handedly. He kind of got a coalition of like 20 rich people to do it. But still, that is an immense amount of power that he had. But even the most powerful wealthy people must die someday, which J.P. Morgan did in 1913 while he was traveling in Rome. He left behind a fortune of $80 million, which is generally estimated to be equivalent to about $2.2 .2 billion today, although I have seen estimates ranging as high as 60, 80, or even 100 billion in today's money, but 2.2 .2 billion is the one that seems to be the most reputable. He left his businesses and his fortune to his son, creatively named J.P. Morgan Jr. J.P. Morgan Jr. lived from 1867 to 1943. He, of course, was active in the world of banking. He sponsored many charities as well, including the Red Cross, and he endowed a rare book collection at the Morgan Library, which is a cause that is very near and dear to my heart because I love rare books. The most influential thing that J.P. Morgan Jr. did was to basically finance World War I. He brokered a deal that made his company the sole purchaser of munitions and supplies for both the British and the French governments. This earned his company a tidy $30 million, or approximately $800 million today. The company also loaned large amounts of money to various allied governments. His involvement in the war was so controversial that in 1915, an assassin named Eric Muenter, I believe, M-U-E-N-T-E-R, entered Morgan's New York City mansion and shot him twice. Uh, J.P. Morgan recovered quickly and went on financing the war. After the war, J.P. Morgan Jr. did not slip into obscurity. He got a job managing Germany's reparations payments. Again, I don't understand how like a private 
person got this job. That should have been something overseen by a council of elected people or 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 people who were like born into into royalty. Something just not just like a private person. But that's neither here nor there. What is here or there is that he died in 1943 and that I could not find an estimation of his net worth for the life of me. So who knows, but it was probably something quite monstrous. J.P. Morgan Jr. had two sons. There was Junius Spencer Morgan III, who lived from 1892 to 1960, and Henry Sturgis Morgan, who lived from 1900 to 1982. We'll talk about both of their family lines. J.S. Morgan III, like the rest of his family, was involved in banking. He was also in the Navy and served in both world wars. Sadly, I have been unable to find in any estimation of his net worth either. He had three children, one of whom was John Pierpont Morgan III, who lived from 1918 to 2004. I've been able to find no information about him other than that he married Claire Bird Ober and that they had four children, all of whom are still alive today. Their names are Junaeus Spencer Morgan IV, John Pierpont Morgan IV, Linda Louise Morgan, and Frederick C. Morgan. I can find no information about any of them, but considering that I had to jump through several hoops to even find their names, it's probably safe to assume that none of them are incredibly wealthy or influential. Now back to Henry Sturgis Morgan. He was, of course, involved in J.P. Morgan and Company, and he also co-founded the Morgan Stanley Company, which was a multinational investment management and financial services company. I'm not going to go into the history of this company because, quite frankly, I don't care about it, and it has really nothing to do with the actual topic of this video. Henry Sturgis Morgan had five children, but the only two who matter for the purposes of this video are Henry Sturgis Morgan Jr., 1924 to 2011, and John Adams Morgan, born 1930. The only information that I can find about Henry Sturgis Morgan Jr. is that he was in the Navy, he had four children, and his second wife was John McCain's sister. John Adams Morgan competed in the 1952 Summer Olympics in Helsinki, where he won a gold medal in the six meter class, which I am told had something to do with yachts. Now, I actually was able to find an estimated net worth for this man, and uh, his net worth is estimated at $100 million, which is a lot of money. So he seems to be sort of the one Morgan, the one J.P. Morgan descendant who is still wealthy. He has three children, John Adams Morgan Jr., Chauncey Morgan, and Quincy Adams Morgan. Those are kind of the names that I would have expected, honestly. John Adams Morgan seems to be the only Morgan descendant who is still wealthy. The other descendants have faded into obscurity and the fortune has been mostly squandered on philanthropy and, well, philanthropy isn't squandering, but mostly squandered on philanthropy and decadent living and bad investments. Now, there's one thing that we have not discussed, which is kind of hovering over that we do need to discuss, and that is J.P. Morgan Chase, because this is a massive company, and it seems strange that this huge and very successful company could be this huge and successful while the Morgan family have slipped into obscurity. The truth is that none of the Morgan family have really been involved with J.P. Morgan Chase Company, or J.P. Morgan Company as it was called back then, since the 1970s. The other company that bears their name, Morgan Stanley, is also destitute of Morgan family members. They have not been involved there since the 1980s. So, there you go. One astronomically wealthy Morgan, and the rest from what I can tell are pretty much your average Joes. A huge, huge thank you to Mary Royal, Kit Kat Stitch, Sandra White, Emily Donnelly, V. Birchwood, Kiara Craft, The Turtle Moves, Patricia Bentley Fay, and Amanda Martin for sponsoring this channel on Patreon. If you'd also like to sponsor this channel on Patreon, there'll be a link in the description below. No hard feelings if you can't. I get it. Money's tight. I'm also going to link to my Instagram down below, and there will be hard feelings if you don't follow me there, because it is free. I'm also going to put my email down below in case you need to contact me for any reason. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Please let me know down below which other families you'd like me to... I almost said conquer. <laughs> which other families you'd like me to cover? There's still the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the other ones. So let me know. I hope that you have a great Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Samhain, Solstice, whatever it is you celebrate around this time of year. I hope you have a good one and I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. We are going to let time pass. John Pierpont, John Pierpont, bleh, John Pierpont Morgan III, Henry, shoot, what's his name?